So one would not be wrong in saying that our earliest cinema was an amalgam of myth and Western films. Then came the talkies and the large scale plundering of theatre. Precious little of it was original in the first place began. Despite the hangover of, excuse me, aspiring to be white, then being at its zenith, what we failed to borrow from them was an indigenous form for making films. Something which, despite the efforts of the intrepid few that we've had over the last 50 years, we have still not brought about uh, in our country. Instead of treating cinema as a new medium, with new aesthetics, with a different set of rules, with different possibilities, we resorted from the start to what is immediately available. The folk theatre, the Parsi theatre, the Northern Key. And of course, mythology, which lent itself beautifully to the, to the illusion that cinema can create. The, uh, the earth opening up to swallow a sinner, the people, the mountains floating in the air, oceans being swallowed, etc. All that was much easier done in cinema. It would perhaps be difficult to differentiate those early films from plays filmed around the same time. In fact, many of them were plays filmed. Thus, these so-called pioneering efforts were not only creating what would become over a hundred years as we keep Tom Browning, not only an irreversible cinema language, but an incurable malaise affecting our films even today. What the early talkies also did was to suck out from the Urdu theatre all the talent that had made that kind of performing a viable proposition. No one from the theatre, not actors, singers, musicians, writers, dancers, choreographers, set designers, poets, not one of them could resist the lure of better money and bigger audiences through cinema. Unfortunately, what all these people also brought with them to the cinema was a sensibility marinated in mythology or plagiarized Shakespeare or musical melodrama, or broad comedy of the folk theatre, or supposedly magnificent productions from the Arabian Nights, if nothing else. It was a sensibility completely at variance with what, what was to become the, the form of presentation in cinema in the future. But we started with it, and we remained stuck with it. Because it was the glue that kept the, the balm that kept the audiences on familiar ground. Theatre audiences in the 30s began to flock to the cinema instead. And our early filmmakers made sure that they were kept happy there as well by peddling stuff as close to what the audiences were used to seeing in the theatre. Those unfamiliar with the theatre were fed a steady diet of mythological stories. Now, if such indeed was to be the setting against which our films were to be made, what was one to expect from the actors? but that they should thoroughly conform. The Parsi European Maharashtrian actors went out of fashion, presumably because of their inability to speak Urdu, which then became the rigor for uh, film actors in India, many of the early films, not so surprisingly being in the Urdu language. And there was also a time when there wasn't such a, a sharp distinction between Hindi and Urdu. Urdu was not considered a Muslim language, nor Hindi or Hindu one, but that's a whole other story. What I'm getting at is, what is an actor supposed to do if surrounded on all sides by falseness? In our filmmaking or our playwriting today, we either turn incomprehensibly arcane or we adhere unabashedly to the formulae which, was, which were already fossilized by the time they were used by 19th century playwrights like Betab and Ahsan and Aga Hashem all of whose writing is described as scrawled in Greece paint by Zia Moedin in his wonderfully concise book, Theatrics, in which he says, these plays were heightened melodramatic pieces with crude appeals to the emotions and usually a happy ending. Actors were not afraid to project themselves. There was no mumbling, no attempt at psychological probing. 
actors acted to the hilt and nobody called them hands, the word had not arrived yet. The conventions of melodrama were rigorously followed. Disguised husbands remain unrecognized by their wives, reprobate heroes defend in the end, characters burst into song every now and then, villains meet their dastardly comeuppance. Sounds slightly familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> the theatre, and I'm still quoting from Mr. Mohitman's book, the theatre in which Hush's capabilities were sharpened grew almost entirely in imitation of the decadent Victorian theatre of the mid-19th century. The only difference being that in the West, by the close of the 19th century, the theatrical theater found itself embattled by the theater of ideas. Whereas the spectacular Urdu theater in Bombay had no such challenge to contend with. It is ironic that while the Urdu theater was, was wallowing in the bombast and bluster of Ruritania, Moscow was producing Sita. Unquote. I assume I may bring this analogy to a close by applying it to the once and future state of filmmaking in our country. The poor quality of acting in our films and our theatre is only a reflection of the quality of the writing and of the sensibility, the quality of the vision surrounding it. Stanislavski's experiments would perhaps have yielded no result if Anton Chekhov had not been around to put that vision into the right words. What kind of actor would Marlon Brando have been if he had chosen to do bedroom comedies instead of Tennessee Williams? Some of his later films give us some idea. Would, would, would Nifun have been the same actor without Kurosawa? Or Shomitra without Satyajit Ray? Or Kinski without Herzog? Or Vahida Rahman without Gurudath? In fact, the American actors involved during the quantum leap that occurred in film acting in America in the 50s are perhaps given more credit than they deserve, uh, highly proficient though they were. It was really the tradition of writing passed on by the Eugene O'Neills and the Clifford Odets to the generation of Arthur Miller and Edward Albee, and, strange as it may sound, the proliferation of television that made this quantum leap possible. Because, apart from the usual confection on television, interviews, real life conversations, tragedies, incidents, arguments came right into their bedrooms. The difference between false and truthful behavior on screen began to become apparent. And this had to have a huge impact on the quality of writing and acting in that country. That many of the more celebrated writers of the naturalist school became known and delivered arguably their, their life's finest performances in the American cinema of the 50s was a lucky coincidence for them. The actors do not deserve sole credit for it. They were working with material that emphasized, which, which blended with, which embellished their psychologically driven style of performing and they were being guided by people to whom form in presentation mattered as much as the mechanics that go into creating a moment of acting truth. These wonderful actors, for all their originality, would have probably been ineffective had they had to engage with inferior writing or faulty guidance. The need to communicate, which much American writing seemed to feel at that time, blended with technical wizardry and genuine performing skill to generate a creative energy which resulted in great innovations in theater and film writing, acting, and presentation. Whereas in India, we are still regurgitating stories from 100 years and more ago, long after the arrival of television. The viewer's ability, strangely, to distinguish between real and fake instead of getting sharper is blurring. The images come at you with such machine gun speed that it is difficult to differentiate. In any case, attention spans are getting shorter. A real life calamity is observed with as much indifference as a Bollywood film is. Values that should be vehemently opposed 
and the style of acting and writing and presentation that should be defunct by now are flourishing and being celebrated. We just can't seem to break free of the theatre as illusion conviction that both our theatre and cinema suffer from. While the output of a screenplay writer is often determined by external factors, the reason for such sparse output by uh, competent playwrights in India is puzzling. The total number of performable new plays in any language except Marathi and perhaps Kannada uh, uh, almost escape mention. And the past efforts of Balan Babu in Bengal or Tendulkar or Alekar in Maharashtra or Karnad in Karnataka notwithstanding there seem to be very few others willing or capable enough to follow their example. Actors therefore have a Hobson's choice of either working in plays written by people who would rather write films and end up writing neither, or working in films written by people who look down on the theatre and wish to make write bigger films. And while everyone is Concentrating on the lowest common denominator, the actor's output is supposed to be honest. And if it is not, if it is perceived as not as not being, no time is wasted in impaling him and roasting him over a fire. A couple of final questions which bother me quite a bit. Is it not a shame that the capability and contribution of Marathi theatre giants Sri Ram Rahu and Nilu Bhule will in the future be assessed only on the basis of the films they did, most of which are thoroughly unworthy of them. Similarly, should the great Utpal Dutt, despite his prolific and committed theatre output, be labelled as not honest only because he simultaneously chose to act in some of the worst films ever made? There are many other examples, but <clears throat> I think I will rest my case by leaving these questions hanging in the air.